Thank you everyone for joining us this morning and welcome to Journey on Wadawalan Country. Good morning, I'm Councillor Rose Hodge, Mayor of the Surf Coast Shire. Welcome to Journey on Wadawalan Country. The Surf Coast Shire proudly acknowledges the Gulagin and the Gadaba Nun peoples of the Eastern Ma and Wadawalan as the traditional custodians of the Surf Coast Shire region. We pay our respects to their ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. As the oldest living culture on earth, we recognise and uphold their relationship to their traditional lands. We're delighted to have you tuned in for this Sunday session event as part of Portal. Thank you to Wadawurrung traditional owner, Karina Eccles, and collaborator and photographic artist, Fern Millen. These women will take a virtual walk on country. Karina will discuss the significance of relationship to place land, rivers and sea, and how this relationship informs every aspect of life. Locally, we know that our First People's story can be understood better. We can help educate and heal to benefit both our First Nation people and the community. We are committed to helping non-Aboriginal people better understand our Aboriginal cultural heritage and how important it is. We hope that events like today's will help to achieve this goal. I will now hand over to Karina, who will use the traditional method of smoking ceremony to cleanse the space for the discussion. language I say Wadarung spirit. May we acknowledge the first mother tongue spoken on this land, the Wadarung spirit. May we acknowledge the first peoples to walk this land, the Wadarung spirit. May we acknowledge the first peoples to care for this land, country, water, all things living and each other. The spirit of the Wadarung people, the heartbeat of our mother. Our mother is our country. The country the Wadarung people have walked, nurtured and cared for for many generations in order to keep the heartbeat of our mother strong. We need healthy country, healthy water, and healthy people. I acknowledge Bunjul, the Wedgetail Eagle. I say Yatni. I thank him for the creation of this beautiful country, our stories, our connection to the Kulin Nations. I acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that may be viewing this today. I'm now going to welcome you with the mother tongue of the Wadarung people, the mother tongue that belongs to this mother and belongs to this country, the mother tongue that my people, my bloodline, my ancestors spoke for many generations. Moon Bengari, Kinkin Bill, Wedigurunguli, Wadawarung, Nalingu Wikimbani, Wadawarungja, Hunani Dulama Bengaraspa, Gayukinguma. Maradop Mukbury. Kimbani Wadarangja. Gayukyung Guma Wadarangja. Kulum Wadanao. Gubada Wadarangja. I say, welcome to Wadarung country. We were gathered on Wadarung country. Let's walk together on Wadarung country. May you take care of Wadarung country. Yatni, thank you.
morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to Portal. My name's Harriet Gaffney, and this is the second of our Sunday morning sessions, Journey on Water on Country with Karina Eccles and Fern Millen. Um, apologies for the sound quality, people. It's uh, multiple different inputs coming into Zoom. So that was very unfortunate, but anyway. As I said, I'm the Artistic Director of Portal and the Arts Development Officer for the Surf Coast Shire. This session is being brought to you live from Wadawurrung Country here on Victoria's Surf Coast. We acknowledge the Wadawurrung as the traditional owners and protectors of this place, the first creators on country and of country. We acknowledge their ancestors who cared for the land, rivers and sea and all things living for thousands of generations. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future who continue on this path. Portal's July series of Sunday morning sessions focuses on the intimate space of the conversation. Each one is led by one of the many women in the Shire's arts and cultural life. Today's session is about a relationship that began as professional respect between Karina Eccles, a highly admired Wadawurrung cultural ambassador who has enriched our understanding of where we live hugely, and Surf Coast photographer Fern Millen, before growing into friendship and now, 10 years on, into a creative collaboration exploring what it means to journey on Wadawurrung country. Before I move on, I just want to encourage you, the audience, to express your thoughts about the session via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We're collating the feedback and I'll be using it when I think about future arts and culture programming at Council. So it's a really good opportunity to let us know what you want more of. We'll also be inviting questions from the audience at the end of today's session. So as Stacey's already said, if you've got any questions for our presenters, please note them down, type them into the chat function and Stacey will collate them behind the scenes. Now to our guests. <clears throat> Karina is a passionate Wadawurrung woman with 22 years experience in Aboriginal organisations and community engagement, advocacy, cultural values, support and connection. She is one of five generations living on Wadawurrung country and is the granddaughter of Auntie Joyce Eccles. Karina is currently the cultural education officer and office manager for the Wadawurrung Aboriginal Corporation in Geelong. Our second guest today is an artist whose photography has won her much acclaim both locally and further afield, Fern Miller. Fern's CV demonstrates quite clearly her passions and themes. She's done album covers and sleeve shots for Neil Murray, Archie Roach and Shane Howard, musicians that have led the fight for reconciliation and justice for Aboriginal Australians for more than 40 years. She was the photographer for the Sea Shepherd's 30th anniversary benefit in California in 2006. And it was Fern's portrait of Archie Roach that I Wee Wee used as his centerpiece for his centerpiece work for the Andy Warhol I Wee Wee exhibition at the National Gallery of Victoria in 2016. So firstly, now that we've got all of that done, I want to thank you both so much for sharing your project with us. Before we dive into the first products from the show or from the project, the photographs that you've completed for the pilot firm. I'd like us just to, you know, explore a little bit of background on you both, if that's okay. Um, so Karina, I'll begin with you. As a Wadawurrung woman born on country, where did your journey begin? Before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge um, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, elders past, present and our future generations that might be zoomed in today and listening. I say Yatni, thank you for everyone that's joined in today and listening to this journey. So me, about my own journey, um, as a Wadawurrung woman that I can now proudly say, um, I use the words that Annie Colleen Howe um, uses, and we'll hear a little bit about that story a little bit later, but who am I and where I belong was not something that I grew up knowing, and it was not something that all my generations of family before me um, were able to stand strong and proud, connected to the land of their bloodline and say who they were and where they belonged with what's taken place in the past history. So I took myself on a journey. I had many struggles as a young girl. Um, the colour of my skin, I was constantly teased and, and challenged about and um, 
be told at a young, at, at a young child I was and that's why I did have the darkest colour skin that my nan was. I wasn't, I didn't know anything else about that. And now that I'm older and can really reflect, I understand um, the spirituality, I understand connection to country. There's so much now that I understand more that you don't as a young child. There's always something about you. And I say the word like, I had a hole in my heart. Um, and culture has been the healing to that hole. And country has been the healing to that hole. So I started my own journey and I actually um, went through the Koori Heritage Trust to find family records. And my journey has been my own journey of walking country, listening to country, which I understand now, it became more in depth for me, when I became a mum for the first time, I wanted my children to know who they were and where they belonged and a journey. So that took, you know, and that's what, you know, really at that age increased, increased my journey. I had a very um, strong Aboriginal grandmother, but her voice remained silent a lot of times um, in walking into my nan's. Mm -hmm. gorgeous little home and there's photos of Kathy Freeman and crocheted um, tissue box covers. Everything was red, black and yellow. Mm -hmm. and, and my nan told me my first language name and she, it was our time of conversation about um, being picked on about the colour of my skin and she, she said to him, you know, they, if they say that, you just, you just call them this word. And, and she said that word and it was the word gabba. And I said, what does it mean then? She said, you don't need to know that. That's just what you say. I'm glad I didn't say that word <laughs> at the time. I know what that means now. But um, yeah, I felt my nan, um, my, yeah, my nan was my strength and that journey has grown. But it's, um, it's a journey that's so strongly connected, you know, to my bloodline, connected to this country, because we are the people of this country and this is our mother. Yeah. And she cares for us and we, in return, care for her. I'm going to come back to that um, because I think that's, that's the major theme that's running through this project is this recognition of, of the, the land, mm -hmm. the earth as our mother. But Fern, I'll come back to you because you, likewise, were born on Wadawurrung country. How did this... You know, how did this journey begin for you? And you know, was it something that you always knew about? Did you always know that you were born on one own country? Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that join us here today, and also all the community that come together to share our stories. Yatni, which is thank you, Moira, is thank you, Karina, for sharing mm -hmm. your story and taking this journey with me and Harriet today. As a young girl, I was very encouraged by my mum as an artist and my father as a sociologist to see the world through my own eyes. I was encouraged to feel into that space, to acknowledge the feeling that gave me, gave me and I always had a really deep spiritual connection to country. I don't know what you call it, innate, a feeling of just wanting to explore the world. And fortunately at the age of 15, I was given a camera and that was like my vehicle to kind of move in and out and weave in between people's stories, capturing those stories and putting them into a place which can be received by others, not through my words, but through my photos. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've been very lucky and nurtured in that space to kind of explore that and never seeing the colour of skin, never seeing, the irony is someone that's a visual artist, it's something deeper beyond the surface that I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. And so we see the surface of what we see in the world, our skin, our face, our beauty, and all those elements that makes us human. But there's something beyond that that I see through the lens or something and I've wanted to capture in sound, in word, in music especially, and the combination of elements that brings us to a place that we all can really, really relate to archetypal. You know, sort of way yeah. as a human and as a human we have this archetypal connection to the elements that we live in that we grow up on and growing up on Wadawurrung country in Geelong in Skeen Street Newtown I had a very uh, you know a, a very privileged upbringing and, and there's been moments through this process where I feel like you know a little bit ashamed and, and not wanting to explore that because I'm a white woman 
and I feel privileged growing up, but I'm very fortunate and I'm grateful to my parents, my father, a sociologist who began at Deakin Uni in 74, who taught me to see people for who they are and hear them and listen to them and, and discover their cultural background and research who they are. Yeah. I'll stop with because I think it's a great idea. Maybe um, Stacey will flick to the first image. And so we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll use those images to sort of guide us through this journey on country. So, Stace, when you pull that image up for us, so we'll look at the details of those works, if we, if we may. And we'll start at, I'm really interested in starting at the top of this image with Karina Fern because you have Karina wrapped in smoke. And it was something I was, when I first saw this image, I was reminded recently when watching the extraordinary film that's screening right now on ABC iView, everyone, I do encourage you to watch it if you haven't, uh, In My Blood It Runs. In it, the protagonist, Juan, says, I was born with a memory. Juan's 11 years old. He's born in uh, town camps in Alice Springs in Hidden Valley. Uh, but he says, I was born with a memory. And for me, this image really evokes the deep time of Aboriginal relationship to, to country. So, Karina, I'm wondering if, and we'll, I think we'll move backwards and forwards between the pair of you talking about these images as we go through. So what's the significance of fire on country? And why is smoke, as we, we have this morning, in fact, I mean, obviously our video this morning of the smoking was taken earlier. However, we did smoke this space for this event today. So why is smoke used at the beginning of significant events, births, deaths, anything of significance, really? What's its place in the Aboriginal worldview? Yeah, fire is a um, significant um cultural tradition um, to country and it's really important. Many people fear fire. Mm -hmm. They fear fire, but fire today is different what fire was for our people. So the word for fire in Wadawang language is wind mm -hmm. and um, fire was used to cleanse country. Fire was used for our smoking ceremonies to cleanse people. So when when you invited, when you know our messenger went over on another country and you invited them to come over on country, you would have your fire going mm. and you would then place, you know, we use a cherry ballad and the eucalypt and you, you would smoke, you would smoke your visitors mm. because the country past our boundary of Wadarung country, it's a different country. So like people leave Australia and there's certain things you can bring in and out. So we would cleanse from the feet. We would cleanse through the spirit. So we know that they any bad spirit that may have come with them, that we were cleansing and getting rid of that. It also lets our Mughals, our ancestors, our spirits know, and Bonjour, our creator being know that we have people on country. And then me and um, Burn started this journey um, when I came here for the first time to start this project. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, like, we'll start and we'll cleanse each other and we'll cleanse the space. And um, this photo come from bringing the smoke through here. It wasn't, we did not set up to take this portrait. It was not at all. Mm -hmm. um, and this came as I was coming through, you know, where we sit today, um, smoking and cleansing this area. And I talk about as we went on that journey and everything we went on together, I would share with Fern as we went and what we were doing as well. So fire is really, really important. We need to look at fire to be caring better for country. And as a Wadarung woman, I have many Wadarung family members that lead the way with traditional fire burning. And um, our future aspiration is that we will hold a very strong Wadarung traditional fire burning team and be able to look after country how our generations of our family have for many, many, many generations. Mm. Fire is really significant to our people, to us. And our spirit is like fire within us internally. Yeah, beautiful. How does it, so when you, Fern, when you were, when you were taking this, like this, this shot in many ways, mm. you, know, you mentioned before you open up the space for the images to occur. When you saw this one mm. after you first took it, how did it strike you about what you captured? That moment in time was a meeting place. That meeting place was cleansed between Karina and I. Quite often a photograph in the artistic practice is 
two people or many people and the photographer coming to a place that's a meeting in the middle. Mm -hmm. A bit like what Karina talked about in the ritual sense of having a fire and bringing people together. Oh, that moment is, you know. So we've, we've all just got by <laughs> wah in wah. that, in that um, yeah, wah the crow, the trickster, the carry fire. Is that right, Karina? Yeah, is it? Yeah, there's many stories connected to wah and country, you know, being the two Māoris with Wadara. Yeah. As my studio Wadara. faces Sorry west in, in, <laughs> in danger, <laughs> we have lots of nature outside the, the studio door and we're seeing Wadara waddle around under the princess comes. And we've all got goosebumps because it's, you know, just that, oh, there he is. You know, we were here so, yesterday, we didn't see him. But we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, the photo, um, in fact, it was quite a challenging time for us all um, during the COVID-19 as we went into a space, and I was still thinking, we've been trying to work towards this project for over a year, and the City of Melbourne had a COVID-19 arts grant, which I applied for, successfully received, and began this pilot project, which was essentially to start with Karina, and then expand into Wadawurrung country, and to get the stories and accounts of many, many Wadawurrung people for the final exhibition in the future. So this moment was also for me, I knew, and after many years talking to Karina about smoking, about cleansing the air, we gathered those gum leaves. We got those, that cherry balat together from the creek behind my house. We brought that in, smoking it in through this studio and in ceremony, we cleansed the space. And it was very, it was very important at this moment in time with the COVID pandemic, because there is a lot that can be learned from Indigenous culture, mm -hmm. about the country that we live in, about the plants, about what we can do to heal the people from our land. Absolutely. And that for me is all of that. And I didn't want to take that photo. I'd set it up to do a video mm -hmm. and record the sound and the crackling is beautiful, <laughs> like silver crackling sounds. But I really know that that smoke means more and it's something it's, a, it's, it's touchable, but it's also achievable by us all. But there's something magical and mystical and spiritual in it. I mean, I think what's really interesting about this image, and we will move on in a second, Stace, but I think in particular with this image, what's really interesting is that you talk about the fact that the use of smoke to um, create space for ceremony is about people bringing people into a moment where everything else is forgotten. There's a timeless quality about it. And this image, too, is timeless. And I'm going to say... Um, I'm going to mention again something that Joanne said in, in My Blood It Runs because I think that there's very interesting parallels in these stories. And what he says is this 11-year-old mm -hmm. is that um, he says he was born with a memory. And to me, this image mm -hmm. really beautifully talks about ancestral memory and, in fact, that, that, you know, there's a timelessness to this image. This could have been, you know, mm -hmm. if we had cameras... 40,000 years ago, you know, this image mm. is, is throughout time in this mm. country, in this place, and that's what's so beautiful. We, we might move to the second image now, Stace, if we could. So this is Norm Jarawa Stanley, who played the ditch at the beginning, and anyone who's, um, you know, been privileged enough to be at any events where Karina has done the welcome to country, etc. Norm is often there beside her with the ditch. So this film that, you know, I'm referencing, and I will stop referencing it, but this, this film that I'm referencing had not yet been released when this project, when this Journey on Water and Country project was begun. Fern, what were you hoping when you first went in to this project? What were you hoping to capture? What was the, you know, or, was there an objective? Uh, and I think, Karina, you probably agree with me on this. It's like sometimes you don't know why you're doing something and it's just something that you do innately. But then through conference and connection as a friend, you get to see, oh, what is it you do? And you realise you're providing a voice and you're creating, you know, a sounding board for community for that, for your what a wrong community to be heard. To your voices to be heard, mm -hmm. to you for to to be seen, and quite often there's a there's this mystery of enshrouded by mystery, uh, and people feel like they can't connect with Indigenous people because there might be a fear of making the wrong 
asking the wrong thing or making the wrong statement. But I say, be free to ask. If it's done in kindness, if it's done with, in thoughtfulness, then there's nothing wrong with that. And so it is essentially providing a voice for my friends, for my friends on country. And over time, through respect and acknowledgement and, and sharing our creative resources. Um, you know, I love to do shoots with Norm and I want to and I'll give him those images. And I want to say Niadni, Norm, if you're watching today, for providing us with that beautiful uh, didgeridoo music at the start. And in return, I like to see that he, you know, he is part of this connection too. We're all part of this family and we can connect together and share the stories that we have. Karina, do you have anything further to add? I think um, just to add initially how this journey started, it, it was um, a conversation that had with Fern that, um, you know, when, when you're asked where, do you, where were you born, many people will say Geelong, Geelong Hospital. But I want to educate every person to know where they were born on the traditional land. What was it? Where were you born? Wadawurrung country. Mm -hmm. Where were you born? Bundijamara mm -hmm. country. Where were you born? You know, going to where they're actually born the country. And that is something we can start with education by starting to educate people in that way. Mm -hmm. But one thing in particular, um, the conversation we had with Fern is, you know, where you live, you should know who your traditional owners are. It is something that we should be respecting that particularly in Wadawurrung country, we've only had one bloodline that survived mm. this country. My grandfather, he lived in Wadawurrung country, he went up to into our country, and our bloodline survived. Mm. Now, we are survivors, we're the longest living bloodline. And for me, my name to share a bit later, well, I'll probably save that for later to share with that image, but um. People should know this, you know, you can go to other parts of the world and people are well aware of who the, what the traditional land is, who the traditional people are, what the traditional language are and who are the people, the mm. traditional owners of the land. So um, Fern had come to me and said, I want to put these images out there and people to recognise them and, you know, they'd be approaching one around people and they'd be in their space. Mm. So, um, you know, I have Auntie Marley Gilson and Deanne Gilson, absolutely beautiful Wadawurrung artists that use their art to tell Wadawurrung stories, you know, other cousins that are strongly connected um, to, you know, our water and strongly connected to fire and you know picture them in their really strong spirit and connection element and have their photo up and with that have a quote of their spirit and mm. their right and wrong spirit and what it means to them and and that was what it was about and because all people they're the things that all people should know absolutely and it, it, look I, I will say Karina I think you know I've lived on water and country now for 10 years and I think in that time and when I first came I came from Aranda country and we'll speak about Aranda there's some Aranda people who will feature in this towards the end however so Aranda country is um the traditional owners of the Alice Springs region um and so I came here and I was actively always looking for you know I was living in Brimley, so there were middens and there were echidnas mm -hmm. and black swans and so I was living on country mm -hmm. and I could see the people who'd lived there for thousands and thousands of years and I could go and sit in the dunes and realise that if you were sitting in you know the huge middens in the second row of dunes back from the from the beach mm. that's where people had gone and in the winter sun you know you were out of the wind and you could see the way they feasted mm. and how these flourishing family groups and yet I couldn't find any information really mm. and yet a decade later you know, the work that you have done with the Deadly Dances and everything to educate us and to help us better Absolutely. understand what it is to be in our own country and the pride as a nation, I feel that we are not allowing ourselves to really own because we have the longest surviving culture on earth and not only surviving, but that flourished until white settlement. Mm. We'll continue with the next image, um, if we may, Stacey. Uh, Sally Groom, if you're watching today, we're not going to talk too much about ochre and water. Stacey, have we got that next image? Thank you. 
we're not going to talk too much about um, well, oak and water, but because Sally, you're going to uh, investigate that further with Karina next week. Mm -hmm. However, um, this shot is entitled Smoke and Water. So what to you is significant, Fern, about this one and why does it form part of the project? There's a place where the river meets the sea. It's down at Point Impossible. It's very close to where you were talking about the middens in Brimley and I've always felt a spiritual connection to it. In the next few images, it captures the sense of space, the feeling that gives us when we're on country. There's something I wanted to know, something deeper that was beyond my knowledge. And I've always felt a deep connection to country in this space. And walking on country with Karina, it was just, it's just, I felt so held. She holds space for me. I created space for you and we we're able to meet in the middle and create this beautiful imagery. I don't really always have words for the photos. I think they can just speak for themselves. And, and the elements, water and fire. And I think what's really interesting is that, um, I'll come to you in a second, Karina, but I think it's really interesting this two, two storytellers using different mediums meeting here. That's what I feel. You know, you're a visual storyteller. You tell story through song, dance, and your incredible eloquence, Karina. We might move on to the next one. Can I just talk yeah. a little about that one again? Oh, sorry, um, jump back, Stace. That was me jumping too far. Sorry, ahead. I just want to share on that one because um, I had three things happening at once that morning. Mm. So <laughs> this was not set up or staged at all. I was doing a live ceremony on country. So COVID has been extremely challenging. Um, it has mm -hmm. impacted enormously, um, you know, all Aboriginal people in this space that have cultural obligations with ceremony and sharing and mm -hmm. education. Yep. We've been heavily impacted. All our ceremony bookings have been cancelled and that is an income for traditional owners. As yep. much as it's a cultural obligation, it is also an income. So we've been harshly. Mm -hmm. So how do you remain, you know, your cultural obligation, your cultural appropriateness of sharing orally? So I only chose a few to do um, live ceremonies out on country. And this morning I was doing this live ceremony and Fern needed to catch up with me. And I'm like, Fern, you'll have to meet me here while I'm doing this live ceremony. And of course, Fern goes everywhere with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and Fern captured this shot. At the same time, though, I was also listening to a live Zoom because I'd been a finalist for the Surf Coast Cultural Walk. Mm -hmm. So there was three things happening here <laughs> at this stage. And, but that just shows the essence of it. Um, as a Wadawan woman, I can't stage this stuff. Mm. I cannot stage this. And Fern is being able to capture it in the moment mm -hmm. yeah. and that is how the storytelling is being captured in the moment yeah and there's a real that, that that's what the images ring with like authentic engagement authentic you know holding of what is occurring or who is being captured by the image shall we move to the next one <laughs> so for those of us as for those of us on the surf coast this image will you know, speak to you, Karina. Would you talk to us a little bit about why mm. we're... Yeah, this is beautiful Wadaram coastline. So this is the area we're talking about, Brimley, Point Impossible. And for Wadaram people, this was a large place of permanent living and gathering for Wadaram people. And along this beautiful coastline, we have midden sites and all along that coastline and some of the, you know, the largest registered midden sites mm in Victoria on coastlines and it shows a large population of Wadaram people that lived, cared, nurtured and were spiritually connected to this land for 60,000 yeah. years and it, the evidence is still there and that's where we need to educate people because those sand dunes and this coastline what you're seeing in those midden sites are thousands and thousands of years old and people that don't know that we find that people are coming through, you know, some of those midden sites, you know, to get down to the coast and running through sand dunes. Often you'll see people sliding down yeah. sand dunes and it's absolutely heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking when you see that. We have the issues of climate change that are affecting us as well and a massive concern for our registered um, significant cultural sites as well. 
this coastline, Wadawang people walked along this coastline, you know, you, from Barwon Head, let's keep walking all the way down to Bells Beach. And, you know, then you go up inland into beautiful Point Addis. And, you know, the names I'm using are actually being replaced. There's Wadawang names for these places. Mm -hmm. And that's something as well that's being lost. Mm -hmm. Is our language has been lost and the original names of these places have been lost and let's hope in time that we can return the Wadawong names because with Wadawong language it tells a story. So an example of Broom Creek, it has another name now but when it's called Broom Creek it means that there's Broom mm. there. So mm. language tells you tells you about that place and what and what's there in that place. But um and what you yeah so you know mm, mm. oh at this and you would also have known the seasons that the broom would be there. So we're gonna carafe. Yeah, that's the, the traditional name. Wetlands. Yeah, and so that you know that movement of people, mm. you know, on mm. country at the appropriate times when there's enough, mm -hmm. you know, to actually to feed people and keep mm. people thriving. And that right. place particularly was a place of plenty because you're right. You have yeah. the wetlands, you have the fresh water, and you've got mm. the salt water. So there you have your supermarket, you have <laughs> your chemists, yeah. you have everything you absolutely need to live a sustainable life. I find it, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but I find it, I mean, and Karina, you might know this, because when I first came here and I'd been living in sort of Central Australia for a long time, you know, working with Aboriginal people from Central and Western deserts. So I came here and I was obsessed. I was absolutely living on Aboriginal country. The evidence of it was so obvious to me, and yet I couldn't find any information. Oh, we've, oh, we've come back to us. Um, can you Mist with Serena Mitch sort of reminds me of the mist when I'm taking the sand on the beach that morning with bare feet, feeling and feeling grounded into that space. There's a lot of mist enshrouded in Indigenous culture and history because our the prehistory of what we don't know is still yet there for us to, to find out. Mm. And that's why this conversation needs to be had. Mm. That's and what I, I need think to say. there's a fabulous um, academic who I, you know have an intellectual crush on called Paul Carter. And he talks about the literal spaces, like the, the, the spaces on the edge and in between built up roads and things. And in Wadawurrung country, you can walk, you know, if you get off the obvious paths and stuff, you know, you can walk our beaches and know and learn. If you've got your eyes open and you're willing to, you know, spend time, you can learn so much about what used to be here. And what is so beautifully being brought back through projects like this, I think, and well, recognising that it's not started gone. Started walking on country walking together. Walking on country. Yeah. That's where yeah. I came up with these grand ideas. <laughs> Sorry, Karina. But, uh, you know, that is why we, partially this project's evolving, getting into the studio to connect just with that individual, but also getting out onto country is very important. And this is my education. So not having that... Um, history and knowledge passed down to me i have had to well um i'm connected to country i don't watch tv mm. this is my tv mm. i will sit on this coastline of an evening and watch the sunset happen and the change and it changes and that's just like someone else sitting and watching tv mm. for me but i walk country because country is educating me yeah and what i know is what i'm being educated by country and it's that fundamental, absolutely fundamental difference between sort of um, Western culture's ideas about what land is and something mm -hmm. that you own mm -hmm. and Aboriginal relationship to country, which is that this is our mother and she looks after us so we look after her and that reciprocal relationship. Mm -hmm. um, we'll move on to the next image, please, Stace. My gorgeous Brimley, I do miss you. Carafe. <laughs> I mean, we are so incredibly blessed where we live. Can I just go... The image Click before, back. Only because it relates to the next image. Ah. Because you can see the dancing waves at sunrise reflected mm. in the next image, which is the dancing cloak. And yeah. the wind picked up just at that moment when <laughs> bundle flew above us in circles. Wow. Out at the Yangs mm. on Big Rock. Mm. And, just as I had, and just as I caught that... Image. This was the only time that time we were standing on the rock together, Karina, when it picked up the tails of the, the coat. Yeah, and, yeah. Then the and again, the this was not staged. I'm not an elder. I don't wear a cloak. 
this day was extremely cold <laughs> and windy <laughs> and we'd gone out there to do some photograph. This was about two years ago. This way actually was two years ago. Mm -hmm. And the cloak was down with the Kulamon and things around it and um, again doing an education session and it was I was absolutely frozen <laughs> and I put the cloak around me for warmth and it just the wind just come under mm -hmm. and lifted the cloak and it was later that Fern said look at look at this cloak look what mm -hmm. happened so again there, this was not staged mm -hmm. and this is I'm not an elder I don't wear a cloak it was about warmth mm -hmm. which this is what kept our people warm yeah. you know the but possum skins are third warmest skin in the yeah. world and well. for us to have this you know yeah. for warmth as well but what remember what happened is that when Unjul flew over it was captured in a reflection in the oh. water well wow can you tell us a little bit about and that water well Karina yeah so again you know many of you would have gone out to the UAs which we call where do you went and um that water well was made by Wadawong people. They naturally grinded out um, that little hollow mm. on the top of big rocks, so they always had fresh water. So this is where it's really, really important, and, and we, um, you can look that story up, um, mm. ABC Wadawong Mother Tongue, and it'll tell you that story mm. that is shared by Uncle um, Brian Powell, um, a beautiful story. And that's the importance of understanding the story of the land and what it means. And I think if people are more educated to understand, it actually helps people to care for it better. Yeah. So the best way to explain it is our country is our mother mm. and she cares and nurtures for us. But in return, we have to care and nurture for a mother, just like we do in our lives. But she's our mother and she has mothered many generations mm. for thousands of years. But again, a it wasn't staged and it told us a beautiful story and yeah. and um, when we left that day um will <laughs> continue to fly with us while we're driving our car yep mm. um one of the things i think it's really interesting that this project that we're exploring this project right here right now you know when we've started the year with the most extraordinarily terrible bushfire season that the country has ever seen mm -hmm. in fact that the world has ever seen and now we've gone into a you know global pandemic mm -hmm. So, you know, both of those things come from the fact that we haven't been looking after country, that we're not, that we're far too concerned with consumption and, and what we can take from country rather than what, how we're actually living with country. And so it seems to me that now it's a really incredibly important, Fern is just rearranging the room, don't worry everyone. <laughs> It was calling me into the space because I felt I needed to um, come back to the country. <laughs> yes, and great. this beautiful um, gift to that deed. Um, yeah, so this, you know, recognizing, and I think again, this, we have a period, you know, it look, you know, we well may go back down into full blown lockdown in Victoria, and it's our opportunity really to think, and to stop and think. What can I do? How do I relate to country? What is my relationship with country? Yeah. We'll move to, um, so these things don't happen in isolation though. I mean, we've talked a little bit about bloodlines. Um, Stacey, we might move to the next image. Bloodlines are very important here. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> How many generations of what are on? Five generations. In the one photo, mm -hmm. wow. All living on my own country. Sorry, I might get emotional. <laughs> so this is my beautiful grandmother, um, Auntie Joyce Eccles. Unfortunately, um, she um, had a stroke now about 20 years ago and has been in a nursing home um, at Lara since then. Um, this was extremely hard. <laughs> extremely hard to have a couple of months old, my granddaughter was only a couple of months old, Nan in, a, in her wheelchair that my dad could not manoeuvre, <laughs> very scary. Um, we had a lot of wind blowing and you know we had the skin to keep Nan warm but Nanny, Nan had hold of her, her blanket so tightly which she does. Um, but this is five generations of around my Nan, 96 years of age and my granddaughter too. This 
in BJ. This is rare in Victoria. Mm. This is rare to still have five generations on country. My, my family returned back to what are on country. Mm. You know, my man and my dad were born up in um, Warrnambool and my man brought her children back, back here and then Nan started her journey with many other um, other family members, um, finding their way. That they were Wadawurrung, mm. and Nan found that out while living on Wadawurrung country. Wow! And um, and she brought her children back here. Yeah. And um, yeah, five generations still living on Wadawurrung country, and we were also the five generations was used as part of the treaty um, ads. Um, that also the beautiful Uncle Archie was part of as well. And um, unfortunately, we couldn't have Nan involved. But I am blessed to have five mm -hmm. generations here on country from 96 to now. I also have now I have a second granddaughter who's only six weeks oh. old. And, um, oh. Thank and you there for was giving in to my in crazy ideas. Well. So Fernanda said, I want to somehow capture it. And I'm like, how do we capture oh. five generations? And Nan just kept looking over at my beautiful granddaughter, Elira, and looking at her and saying, I love you, oh, I love yeah. you, I love you, she kept saying. Oh. And um, yes, yeah, so I thank Fern for, for capturing that. And I, I'm just I'm grateful for you giving She's in our matriarch. crazy ideas. <laughs> and Tess said, I'm just gonna take her out the rock. She's gonna time. go down to the nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> when I say matriarch, she's our queen. She, mm. um, so from Nan, Nan had 10 children and she now has um, over, I think we're up to about 78 oh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. Wow. So when you're talking about cultural knowledge, if Nan was able to, which she's not unfortunately, if she was able to maintain being that educator, no school teacher would want 78 children as a, <laughs> in a classroom, do you know what I mean? So that's where it is really an obligation for all of us to learn, to be able to continue to teach the stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really yeah. interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting, I think, you know, like one, that so you, if your nan is 96, then she's grown up in sort of the most, really, the most appalling sort of times of white sovereignty and, and racism. Absolutely, like, predominantly against Aboriginal people mm. and yet she so proudly holds to those markers you know the the black yellow and red and you know still holding and, and now finally you know hopefully we're seeing a shift so that you can stand and be proud of you know five generations of Wadaran mm. people on country. Mm. Um, Stacey we might move to the next image so we're going to look have a, um, a look at some more generations of First Nations people on country on one oh, country. Hill. <laughs> so Beautiful, deadly many of us will know the Deadly Dancers. Karina, how did the Deadly Dancers come about? What's the what's the importance of them? Okay, so how did the Deadly Dancers come about? Again, um, it has started. Um, my children were part of a would be part of dancing with other Aboriginal children um, when they were quite little. And it was a very, it was a very strong part of their identity in connecting to the wider community, the Wadawurrung wider community back, yeah, 18 years ago now. Um, then what took place, we had a growth of, um, I'd continued with my children, they'd grown out of it. I, um, have cared for many other Aboriginal children. And I would connect them as well to that local um, dance group that was happening at the time. Then from that grew girls. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. <laughs> um, I think now I have over 20 girls wow. in that group. And this image was International Women's Day. And again, Fern was at that event on behalf of City Greater Geelong. Mm. Marsha, a very strong Aranda, not, uh, uh, sorry, Marsha, <laughs> for listening. Uh, very strong woman, very um, strongly connected, very strong spirit. And she was coordinating this Women's Day event. And after we celebrate the ceremony, Fern captured this photo. It is so strongly important. I talk about my own journey of not having a sense of belonging, 
not having the opportunity to do this. And these girls come together and they connect and they connect to each other. But it is also about leadership. So those older girls have responsibilities of helping get the young girls um, painted up with ochre and having that responsibility to lead them with the dancing and that as well. So dancing on country does only belong to the traditional owners of country. Um, the dances these children do, because I only have a few that are Wadawurrung, mm -hmm. we don't dance specific stories that our Wadawurrung traditional owners dance. We also, I was granted permission for that mm -hmm. um, by elders, uh, Wadawurrung elders many years ago. But um, I think my face says it all here. Yeah, the joy. You know, and as Aboriginal people, we carry, all children are our own children. And we, we care for each and every person, each and every family member, mm. and each and every Aboriginal young person that is on this, living on my own country. And can I say, the faces of those girls brings me so much joy because I've seen many of them over 10, a decade photographing them dance and how much the dance has educated me to understand what our own country mm. and the people in, in it. And I, I thank you girls, all of, you, all of you out there, for doing that for me and for everyone in our community because your spirit, when I see you fly, when you dance, brings so much joy and I love capturing you in that moment. Yeah. And I also want to say that these girls, although they are culturally safe in a culturally safe environment, but they are culturally safe with Fern taking a photo too and that's what is really important. Mm -hmm. From someone being behind a camera, mm -hmm. they need to understand respect and cultural safety as well. And yeah, as you see there, you <laughs> see strong Aboriginal girls, if you've seen them outside of that space, they'd be really, really shy. Also I want to mention two of the dancers, we're going to hear their beautiful voices later, which is another way, you know, their, their spirit connects mm -hmm. with song. Mm -hmm. So let's just for a moment before we move on to the next image. So let's talk a little bit then for the for the audience for those people who haven't had the you know the fortune of good fortune of spending time with you, Karina, and things. What you know what makes something culturally appropriate? If you've got a photographer there, in what way does Fern act that makes her work? You know, that makes her be able to actually not control the situation, but just allow and to take exactly what's there, take the shot of exactly what's there. Well, say in, in the space um, of or being in the space, often when there's cameras and videos, we do always say that, you know, videoing, it's our, ultra sh we, our ultra oral sharing, should I say, um, that's really, really important. So we do ask that, you know, no video is taken of ultra sh oral sharing. Many, photographers will come along and snap, snap, snap. You've got to take time, you've got to consult, you've got to ask, and more importantly, you have to ask before you go releasing that into the media as well. You've got to ask, what are the words? That is our intellectual property. What we are sharing is thousands and thousands of years old as well. And it's also about as well that's really really important so you must give time to build relationship you must ask you must consult don't be afraid to do that and i think that's a really important point and it's, it's going back to that point that Fern made earlier ask if you don't know if you have fear ask, ask. reach yeah. out and ask and my life is all more enriched and all of ours are to have that have that connection and have that discussion because you don't have someone rock up to your house and you don't ask them why they're there. You just say, what are, what are you doing here? What are you up to? What is your name? Where are you coming from? It's the same thing. You just take that out into community and space. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because we all, like, we've grown up in this, you know, a system, in one, one system, you know, the Western system. And I was reminded of that so starkly. I used to be a teacher in Alice Springs, but I was reminded of it so starkly when watching that film as well because... There's the image of Juan sitting in the classroom mm. and it's like the sound sort of bleeds into it. And it, to me, it just was mm. absolutely, mm. that was white, the white noise of white culture, of, of Western culture and the way that it obliterates mm. other cultural norms. But really, when we say just ask, if you don't know, just ask, it's really about going, oh, I'm learning about a different way. And just as I like to have good manners in my own cultural Mm -hmm. paradigm 
let me what what's how do I show demonstrate good manners in this arrangement so that relationships so that trust is formed and relationships can build. If you and I go to a concert at Hamer Hall and someone performs, they dance or they 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 play Hugh Masakala played trumpet and I photographed him that time. You find out, you say thank you, and you acknowledge the artist. Mm. It's the same in just a normal everyday situation like these girls perform. We acknowledge them. We see their names. We share that as an acknowledgement. And when Norm plays, we acknowledge it. It's not something we should take for granted mm. and just say, oh, that's a welcome. Oh, that's a token mystic didgeridoo. It's not. It's like you live and you breathe in that moment together and you acknowledge those people. It's as simple as going to a a concert and just say, that artist is here, we acknowledge them. These girls, these dancers are here, we acknowledge them. Mm. And it's, yeah. it's, it just seems to be something that should cross over all of those, those areas. So we will move on to the next, and this is, this is you know, possibly one of your best known mm. shots, Fern, <laughs> or certainly most evocative. It's just you know, a glorious shot. Tell us a little bit about this. With, with Archie. The, the name is about being with Archie, saying, I hear you, I stand with you, I walk with you, we are with you. With Archie was taken right here, right here with this beautiful piece of nature sits in our studio. I was so humbled by him sharing with me his story that day. We spent half a day here in the studio about five years ago and we did some things out in the bush out the back, but with Archie um, gave me an insight into him allowing me to hear his story about the children being taken away. And it's, those things, it's really important for us, I think, for um, settler Australians to recognise that the extraordinary damage that's done to generations and why people, particularly in places like Victoria, where actually the colonial project, which is what settlement was, you know, we were looking at the end of Britain's movement across the world and creating empire, you know, and that was all about finances and Britain becoming wealthy. And by the time they got to Victoria in 1835, I had had hundreds of years of working out the best way to take control of someone else's land. And so the decimation that occurred in Victoria is unlike anything that was seen. Yeah. It was so rapid and so total. So, and then that, you know, to then start taking children away, you know, to further try and you know, kill off a culture that's sort of standing in your way. So it's really these conversations, we're not talking about history that is past. We're talking about intergenerational hurt. And as a nation, I, I very strongly feel, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this too, Fern, as a nation, I really strongly feel that we need to recognise, white Australia needs to recognise its, its past. I think we should do um, well, we, we are actually um, moving towards time. So, can I just acknowledge um, Archie for coming here and being with me here on Water on Country on that day and also allowing me to give that space? It's not about controlling the situation, as Karina and I discussed. Sometimes it's just about providing a space as an artist, allowing that person to be in the moment and feel safe, mm -hmm. feel trusting that. They can deliver to the camera what I need them to deliver. I said to Ashley, this is not a promotional shot. This is, this is just a story shot and it's behind us here in the studio. And, and I like, for me, just personally, a reflection on that is I like how he's keeping something for himself. Mm. You know, because sometimes when we're torn and we're hurt and people are taking things from us, it's nice to just give ourselves something back and just hold that for him. Mm. For me, that... Mm -hmm. That I like that that photo doesn't give everything to the viewer. Mm. It takes something back mm. and we go inward and we feel, and I think that's why they've had success in, in being in the Moran Prize and, and various things. It's, it's now hanging at the Deakin University in the Indigenous Koori Centre there. And, and he's, it's about keeping something, mm. keeping something for yourself. 
So even in the sharing and, and the unfolding of history and prehistory and developing that connection and understanding, we've got to respect, we've got to hold space, we've got to allow our Indigenous people to hold something for themselves. Yes, because we've taken mm. so much. Mm. We're going to move on to the next slide because as much as that's deeply painful, there is incredible strength in the community living on water on country. Karina, who have we got here? We've got <laughs> Norm again. Yeah, Norm and Yurimul here. And um, again, you know, not staged or anything burned, but captured emotion, captured strength, worlds, captured, two yeah, two worlds. And that is, you know, it is what it was about, bringing, you know, many Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal people together, but Aboriginal people being in a space where they they could always share their spirit, with, you know, whether it was through song, playing yudaki, dance, all types of elements of music. It was a beautiful festival. Mm. Um, we all have journeys. You know, I share a little bit about my journey today, but the two fellas in front of us as well have their journeys and their stories as well. And, you know, the history for thousands and thousands of years of their bloodlines. And, um, and I love that too. Um, just they, they look safe in each other's arms. Okay, That's the story that tells. And it says to me, I see you, brother. Yep. And I see you back and I hold space for you. And that, for me, is representation of the Two Worlds Festival, thanks to Melissa and Cam, who ran that festival for many years and have continued to support Indigenous youth with uh, education up in for the Yolunga people in North East Arnhem Land and uh, the way from where Yoram was from. So it's also not only the two worlds bringing non-Indigenous and Indigenous people together, but recognising that many nations of Aboriginal Indigenous places, they have their own culture, they have their own nation, they have their own stories and they have their own sense of place. And so that is two nations holding each other. Yeah. We'll move to the next one, Stace. I know that we're... We did get carried away, so we're going to have to start flicking through. That's a gorgeous image of those boys, those young boys. Taken in the studio with Yorama and the Yulungu boys through the connection uh, with Cam Beg and Melissa Patterson again at Two Worlds. We'll keep going, Stace. <laughs> and when was this one taken? Well, we revisited after walking on country. We came back to the studio uh, and this is also part of our project that we are doing and we have done the pilot. Many of the images you've seen have also come from past projects and images, but the one that I'm doing, the pilot with Karina, to take a walk on Wadaron country to uncover what uh, it means to, to our First Nations people to find reconciliation uh, in this country. And so now we're looking at Oka being placed on the face. Karina is facing north. And she holds her hands and she, in her spirit, she, as you said before, some of these images are timeless. And I think they should extend beyond time because this is something that has been passed down through generations and generations to her from knowledge and understanding of what ochre means to be placed on the face as part of ceremony. Well, it's that being born with a memory, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it brings me back to storytelling as well. Uh, dancing for the first time with my Wadarung family up in Ballarat mm -hmm. and a cousin. I hadn't danced before as much as I had the little deadly dances that I watched over. I'd never actually danced myself and given that opportunity for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, it meant so much to me that first evening dancing and one of my cousins, she gave me the Kunawara markings that night. The Kunawara is a black swan and... Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that's been strongly connected to me and it was strongly connected to me at that time too. But it's also understanding the connection, you know, with Oka, mm -hmm. um, to our mother and in dance. And, but it is also important to understand that every traditional group has different stories in Oka, different reasons that when you see Oka as part of ceremony, that is also a way of telling story too. So it's, um, it's another way of understanding, but the colours all mean something mm. as well and tell stories. Mm. And your jet black hair reminds me of a black swan. 
Indeed. Now, I see that we're getting some, uh, some nice comments coming in. What we might do, because we have got to that time where we should invite the audience in and I should stop being greedy and, you know, hogging you both. So thank you so both so much for sharing the beginnings of this project with us. Stacey, I think what we could do perhaps is um, if the audience has some questions, if you'd like to type them in now, and then maybe what we'll do is we'll just slowly flick through the rest of the images um, feel free, ladies, to say, oh, I want to talk about that one as we go, mm -hmm. um, just so that we can show you all of the images, but also, you know, try and keep some, some time here. So we'll move to the next image while you're getting your, your questions out, and I will, be, um, I will be quiet for a moment. And Stacey, if you want to uh, read the questions out to our panellists, that would be wonderful. Okay. Hi guys, I'm back again. Hello. <laughs> we had some really great feedback during the session, which was just lovely. Um, specifically, a lot of people were really interested, Karina, in finding out um, names of local places, Indigenous names of local places and areas of significance. Um, specifically, someone mentioned Point Addis. You can talk about the significance of that area? All areas are of cultural significance. Um, it's not for me to, you know, I always share, um, share those stories, but just be mindful that all places of this coastline are of cultural significance and storytelling. Respect, appreciate, look at what's around, look at all the resources that are around, you know, look at the landscape and the environment and and what you can see. So it's important that you look with your eyes and you listen with your ears and country will tell you the stories of that area. I just also want to mention that we do have a Wadarung language app. If you have an iPad or iPhone, you can download that. Wadarung language app intro. So it must be the intro one that you download. It's a free, but it, when you download it, it brings up the words and it has a speaker and you can press on the speaker and it'll tell you. So if you want to look up a magpie, it'll tell you that the name is Pawa and then you press the speaker and it'll help you to pronounce mm. Pawa. Also just to um, educate people that our language was not a written language. It was all oral and we used a lot of body language. We point, you know, we looked over, we used our eyes, we used our hands. We didn't need a huge language because it was connected to us, it was connected to what we heard on country. So some people will often challenge the written language of Wadarang. Don't challenge it because it wasn't written. The written language we have has been written by non-Aboriginal people that first came into contact with Wadarang people. Right. I, I know language, like as a, a writer myself, language is really important. I think with connecting people to something and um, like just yesterday when I was walking um, through, uh, well, not yesterday, the day before, when we went for a walk with um, my children um, out behind lawn through the bush out there, it just, I, I kept thinking to myself, it's really good to know like the, the local names for some of these places, you know, because it gives you just a bigger connection to things if you have some language to describe that. Um, so yeah, that's great to know about that app, Karina, <laughs> I've downloaded it. Um, there's been some really great um, feedback um, from people on, um, oh, Nita has just said, um, he said thank you and uh, thanks for your generosity and, um, and, and your artistry, Fern. Um, thank you for your generosity, Karina. But um, and where, where would you like to take your future collaboration with Fern? She's asking. Um, so we're hoping we can, we can collaborate and engage more Wadarang and bring the Wadarang. So we hope that we, we can have an exhibition or we can have, you know, the portraits of Wadarung for people to see, we are Wadarung, this is Wadarung, we are Wadarung, we are the people of this land and this land mm. is, uh, you know, at that connection and know, and know 
Wadawurrung people. And part of the developmental uh, um, grant that I received from the City of Melbourne is also to develop it's a developmental project. And so I'm learning the art of interviewing and recording those stories. So we have recorded that from Karina and the idea would be to, this is our pilot and we would extend it once we know what we want to get, do it properly. So take the time to get it right, which applies to understanding uh, our local Indigenous people and across Australia. But take the time to get it right with Karina and then we will slowly get, reach out to other Wadawurrung people that I've met and known over the years, but also getting to know further afield in Wadawurrung country, which extends right up to Wyndham, out to Ballarat, down to Aries Inlet and right around the Ballerine. Uh, so there's many Indigenous people that need to be included in this, this map, this story of people and hear, hear them and their voices and those photographs will be displayed in a place yet to know, to be known. I'm hoping that we might be able to do it, you know, at Shire, mm -hmm. you know, first. <laughs> Again, I haven't been to time greedy. But uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> we had a really lovely comment um, from Molly uh, and she says, uh, both of your words have really hit her soul. Um, she said she thought Fern's point about being afraid to understand is really important. Um, and she said she thinks this brings up another point about ancestry. And um, Molly grew up in a heavily Celtic family and by learning this first connection to land through Celtic culture, there is serious empathy for Aboriginal people and the connection to land. This is the similarities across Indigenous cultures that connects us all. It isn't just about the physical land. The land is us, it is we, it is I, and it is me. Mm -hmm. uh, Niante, to both, to you both, and I'm going, to, I'm going to wreck this, it's Scottish Gaelic, um, Tapad Lit, which is, uh, thank you, <laughs> Scottish Gaelic, from my ancestors to yours for your teachings. So sorry for the long message, but that was a beautiful yeah. message. I thought that was worth it. It's interesting. I'll just quickly, um, we had a, before the session began, we were just having a chat about the act of smoking and then Aboriginal people, you know, dancing barefoot on the earth and things and talking about that those, you know, the smoke, the didgeridoo, then the smoke and then the dancing on the, the earth, they all bring you to that deep place of, it's a, it, you know, in well-being speak, we'd call it mindfulness, but it's something much, 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 much older than that. Deep earth. Yes, indeed. And, you know, and so... You know, the oldest surviving culture on earth, you know, 80,000 plus years. So, yes, that Celtic sort of, you know, those, those same elements, I think we can see them in almost every uh, spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. You know, deep types is yeah. you know, something that we see through Pacific Islanders, through Celtic, mm -hmm. Native American, Indian, African. You, you look at some of the artworks across the world and we're often coming back to one space where circle often means gathering, mm. people gathering together. There's many archetypes that come from a deep place, mm. deep place that sometimes has no words. I think too, though, um, a lot of the time people will take off from where they're living to go learn, you know, travel mm. across the world to learn other cultures. I think it's just so important that you learn the culture of where you're living. Yeah, that is what's really, really important. Stories of what you're living, the language. You know, you, you need to understand all that of where you're living. It is here. And what better time than 2020 COVID-19 <laughs> lockdown number two? <laughs> Stace, were there any more questions? Um, there were a lot of questions, but there is a lot of really lovely comments. Um, yeah, um, Shay, Chrissy Stowe says, such humility in this space, such grounded wisdom, really appreciate you three creating this space. So that, that was a lovely comment. Um, I think earlier on, uh, we had a comment from Bonnie too, just, um, and she, I think, just wanted to, for us to explain uh, that uh, Norm was not a Wadawadang man. Um, and I, I don't know, Karina, if you wanted to go further into that because we had a quick chat about that this morning. Yeah, we did have a, a chat about that and everyone was educated that Norm is not a Wadawurrung man. Um, Norm lives on Wadawurrung country and his Yudaki playing is a passion and spirit of him. He has grown, grown up on Wadawurrung country and worked in Wadawurrung country and has two children to um, a Wadawurrung woman. Mm -hmm. 
that that was um, it was great to have his um, artistry with us this morning to introduce the session. So, what is the significance, really quickly? What's the significance of for you now? I mean, and cultures, all cultures are living, living things, you know. So things don't stay fixed. I've got deep relationships with you know First Nations people from Central and Western deserts, and things do change with time. So, what's the significance for you and for Norm with using the Yidaku to start ceremony? Um, so. It's, it's a choice by people and when they ring and want to put book that, that is a choice by them. Mm -hmm. um, the Yidaki is not a cultural practice that was part of Wadarong country. Um, the Yidaki comes from a certain tree. It's not for me to talk about because it's not women's business. That's right. mm -hmm. um, and that was something my man taught me at a very, very young age as well, um, the story around that. So it's not for me to talk, but yes, it mm -hmm. comes from a certain tree that does not grow on Wadawurrung country. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it is not a tradition for us, but if people want the Yadaki as part of that, um, and I, but I think, you know, for me too, it is accepting of all all Aboriginal people mm. and all the all of what across Australia are the, those strong things and the beauty mm. of the different mm. landscape and what it brought and, and the resources and that that brings you know like the Yidaki. Yeah and that feeling of just getting to know what what a wrong people are and who they are and what they bring culturally uh, is it's just a really that information is really nice to know what 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 is locally traditional and what is from other nations in Australia. Um, so with that then, I'm going to have to start wrapping us up because obviously it's 12.30 already. Um, ultimately, this conversation has really drummed home for me the understanding that real reconciliation is built on relationships, individual relationships between First Nations and settler Australians and relationships between individual and country itself. I want to thank you both so much for giving us such an intimate look at what journeying on water on country means for you. You've helped us understand the utmost importance of the planet and its elements for First Nations people. Knowledge that this extraordinary year in human history tells us day after day after day is vital if we're going to survive. Mm. As a species, we've become so removed from our place in the world, we're not separate from this planet. We must revere her, listen to her and look after her. Thank you both so much for your generosity and trust in sharing this pilot project with us. Let's keep our fingers crossed that by the time NAIDOP week comes around in November, we can all come together again to view more of the work and to celebrate living on water on country together. Uh, now I'll just let you know what's coming up on Portal this week. So if you don't have any plans to get out later on this afternoon and you want to keep connecting through art, then join Auntie Bronwyn Raisin, Gunditj Mara Woman, and the Waiapawa Watnanda Marangi, or we all come together in a meeting project. We'll be joining a weaving circle and be inspired by some wonderful First Nations weavers and use your creative license to exhibit your own works in public spaces. Over time and space, the project's hope is that woven circles will grow across the Shire, state, nation and beyond to form a network of meeting places and connections. Uh, like the rest of regional Victoria, we're also worrying that we're going to go back into lockdown. So we invite you to join Kaz Artsy this Wednesday night for a free workshop on creating mandalas and start to use your own driveway to engage both your kids neighbourhood and the community in some creative well-being. Don't forget to tune in this coming Thursday at 10am to hear another wonderful Surf Coast artist, children's author and illustrator Renee Trammell read from her latest works and I want to apologise to Steph Bremel for last week having confused my own program in my head and finally however next week we again have the privilege of spending time with Karina. This time as she discusses the importance of ochre and water with the president of the Art Spaces Management Committee, Sally Groom. Register for that today. Uh, for details of these events, surfcoastartstrail.com.au. And we're now going to close out the session with the beautiful voices. That was probably my phone. We're now going to close out the session with the beautiful voices of three young girls singing Bangladesh.
Karina, can you tell us yeah. can you tell Bengarak. us the meaning of this before it starts? Yeah, so Bengarak is a um, a thank you is a song that I wrote in Mataram language for Deborah Cheatham. So Deborah Cheatham runs a short black opera which consists of um, Aboriginal children that live down here in Wadaram country and some Wadaram um, young people are in that choir as well. This song they wanted to sing to thank Wadaram people and thank Wadaram country mm -hmm. for caring for them as Aboriginal young people living on Wadaram country. The way Deborah Cheatham has composed this is absolutely beautiful but these two voices of, of two young girls um, are absolutely beautiful, but their voices, they really touch you. So I want to thank Nara and Sissy um, for singing this and it being yeah, part of today. Sissy. So, Yatni, yeah, Kanamo. Thank you. Girls. Love you both. Thank you, girls. Thank you.